Um, definitely. Okay. So, yeah, I think um, in the next 25, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you something very useful for just about everyone, uh, hopefully, and which is how to dig in and get started with uh, analyzing and using uh, simulation data, so galaxy and cosmological simulation data. I put here uh, a lesser TNG, but actually, but actually I wanted to make the title, if I can change the slide, a slightly more general, because indeed a lot of what I'll talk about is um, applicable to the two or three um, simulations which are currently publicly available. So just be beyond just a lustrous TNG. Okay, so uh, I wanna start with two picture slides, which are fluff. And the point here is important though. The point is that in modern cosmological simulations, we have an extraordinary amount of information, right? So these images are showing from the left to the right, the dark matter, the gas density, the gas velocity, the stellar structure, the gas temperature, the gas mobility, shocks in the gas, the ma magnetic field of the gas, and X-ray emission from the gas. These are just a sampling on large scales, so you know, 100 megaparsec scales from top to bottom, of the kinds of information content we have, which covers, again, the dark matter, the gas, uh, the stars, and not shown here, also the supermassive black holes. Uh, it's good to keep in mind that when you go from large scales to small scales, you have simultaneously in these large volumes actual galaxies, right? Actually highly resolved, I would say, individual galaxies. So I'm showing you images from TNG 50 just to emphasize that point, right? So this is a smattering of TNG of uh, Richard Zero, uh, nice looking stellar lights mock images of galaxies, showing you some of my favorites, showing you the uh, incredible range of structure, right? All the way from the interiors of disks at kind of kiloparsec and even sub kiloparsec scales out to the CGM and out to uh, 100 megaparsec level. Okay, so cosmological simulations. We're talking about, I think you can see my cursor. Let me change it to a laser. We're talking about Illustris, TNG, Eagle, Horizon, Gen, Simba, these kinds of projects. Uh, I like to refer to these as synthetic universes in a box. Right? So these are literally cubic boxes where hopefully we have a statistically representative uh, galaxy population and thus representation of the universe. The volumes we're talking about here these days are roughly 50 to say 300 uh, co-moving megaparsecs on a side. And these are the four main constituents right, that we have. So we have the gas represented as the fluid, of course, and then the dark matter, the stars, and supermassive black holes, all represented as embodied particles. In a simulation like this, you're going to have roughly 100 snapshots. So 100 snapshots between the initial condition, which is redshift 100 or so, and redshift zero. Right? Each one of these 100 snapshots is big. That could be a few terabytes each. And each one contains, roughly speaking, for gas, dark matter, stars, and black holes, where they are in space, and then a list of properties of those particles. So these are the snapshots. Accompanying that are the catalogs, right? So each snapshot has a catalog, which tells you what's collapsed structures we've actually found and identified at that point in time. These are the dark matter halos, and then subhalos, uh, also galaxies. The third piece of information we have is a merger tree, which although it does tell you about murders, it's simply the way that we link things in time. Right? If you don't have the connectivity in time, then each of these 100 catalogs and 100 snapshots are fully independent at different points of time uh, throughout cosmic evolution. Okay, so I wanna make two quick points here. The first is about resolution. Resolution is always finite, always limited in these simulations. As we discussed in the past weeks, it's best in the interstellar medium at high density, and it always gets worse towards lower density gas out into the CGM. The second point is about the physical realism of the simulations. I'll simply say that they're getting very good. This is not a science talk. I just want to make the point that you can often go into these modern galaxy simulations and simply look at what happens, look at the outcome without worrying too much about is it correct enough. Of course, it certainly could have issues, could have uh, tensions in certain regimes, but they're getting very good, the physical outcomes and the um, yeah, the, the properties of the galaxies and their environments, which result. Okay, so what kinds of halos and what kinds of galaxies actually exist in these simulations? These are simply two histograms of 
dark matter halo mass on the left and galaxy stellar mass on the right for three kind of representative volumes, 50, 100, 300 whole moving megaparsecs. So if you look anywhere, your favorite halo mass, so Milky Ways, and you look up and you look at what the number is here, this tells you roughly how many objects are those, how many exist in such a box in a 0.2 dex bin, so plus or minus 0.1 dex. This drop off of the massive halos to the right side of these figures, this is the uh, natural result of a limited volume, right? These are rare objects. On the other hand, the drop off to the left hand side here, this is numerical, right? These turnovers represent the smallest objects which exist, which are identified in the simulation. So this is the absolute minimum where you can look at halos or corresponding galaxies for a given resolution. Okay, so this is my one table about the simulations. It has quite a few important points. So the three different rows are kind of three different classes of resolution. So on the top is TNG50 high resolution, then we have the kind of intermediate resolution volumes, TNG100, the Lustre simulation, the old one, the End Eagle, and on the bottom, uh, larger volumes, TNG300 and Simba at lower resolution. So the first column here gives you the spatial resolution, which is to say, uh, below this number, there's not much going on. There's not much happening in these simulations. You could think of everything as essentially smooth below the scale, roughly speaking. So 200 parsecs up to around a kiloparsec for lower resolution simulations. The next column is also very important. This is the minimum galaxy mass, stellar mass, you would ever want to think about. Right? So you'd ever consider possibly resolved, possibly of interest. Um, so if you say, I want maybe a minimum of 100 stellar particles or 1,000 stellar particles or maybe 10,000 dark matter particles in my halo, these are the kinds of numbers that you get. So stellar mass greater than 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 for the very high resolution simulations, even up to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 as the minimum galaxy stellar mass you probably want to consider in doing analysis. And these last four columns give you some counts, right? roughly the number of objects you have in these kinds of volumes. Dwarfs, lots, lots and lots and lots, never short of dwarfs. Milky Ways, say 100 in a small volume, 10,000 in a really big volume. Massive groups, maybe 20 or so. In TNG 50, thousands. In TNG 300, and big clusters, one, of course, in 50 megaparsecs. They're quite rare, and only a few hundred uh, clusters, about 10 to 14, in a big volume. Okay, pushing into the actual data of the simulation, what does it look like? For us, the data is in HTF5 files. Uh, if you like these, great. If you don't, don't be frightened. But an HTF5 file is essentially the same as a FITS file. But in the end, it doesn't even matter, right? Because we rarely touch the actual files. But if you go to a snapshot, so snapshot 99, which is zero, and you say, list me everything that's in that HTF5 file, this is what an actual snapshot of the simulation looks like. So there's a bunch of metadata here at the top, and then we see part type. 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, five different types of particles. These correspond, right? So part type 0 is the gas, part type 1 are the dark matter, part type 3 are tracers, part type 4 are the stars, and part type 5 are the supermassive black holes. So what does this mean, right? For every gas cell, part type 0, each of the 15 billion gas cells in, say, TNG 300, we know the XYZ position, so the three vector of coordinates, and we know all these other properties of every single gas cell. Similarly for the dark matter, the stars, and the black holes. So this is what I call the snapshot. This is the particle level data. It's quite large. Along with the snapshot, we have the group catalog, right? And the group catalog is similar. It has just two things. It has what we call groups, which are halos, the dark matter halos, and we know a bunch of properties about each of them. And it has subhalos, so both dark and luminous. So a dark subhalo would be a subhalo with no stars, and a luminous subhalo, which has stars, that would be what I would call a galaxy. And again, we know lots of pre-computed properties about every halo and every galaxy in the simulation. Okay, so given all that data, what can you actually compute about the gas, the stars, the black holes? And the answer is a whole lot of stuff. Basically, everything you could possibly imagine some of which are very directly from the simulations, so you have the temperature density, star formation rate of the gas, others which require more post-processing or modeling efforts on top of the simulation. For instance, metal ions coming from cloudy, X-ray emission coming from APEC, 
so on and so on. Information about the stars, high energy observables, radio observables, the shocks, things about the black holes, things about the dark matter, an extraordinary amount of information is in these simulations. And this is all again at the particle level. So all this content about the gas and the stars and the black holes exists also in the context of what galaxy or what halo that matter is sitting within. You can also, of course, correlate and look at the relations between all these properties of the particles and the gas uh, as a function of the galaxies and the dark matter halos. Okay, so in terms of actually using the data, right, there's three ways. Um, and I'm talking here about the, the data release platform for Lesser's TNG, which I'll show you in just a second. There's three kind of fundamental ways um, to, to look at the data. First, I call it local data, local analysis. Local means on your machine. So here we're talking about actually downloading the actual raw data files uh, to your system and working there to do the analysis. Okay, second option is remote data, local analysis. So here you leave all the data on the remote server, but you do the analysis on your own machine. And here we're using an online API, so a way to interact with the server to get back uh, small pieces of data. The third option I call remote data, remote analysis. So you leave all the data on the remote machine and you also do all the analysis on the remote machine. This is very nice. This is through a web-based uh, Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook kind of interface. Okay, so option number one, if you want to download all the data yourself, who am I talking to here? You have your own cluster and you have your own storage, right? This would be a requirement. If you want to do complex or slow analysis, you're thinking option one. There's lots of examples in this context in these three languages. So Python, MATLAB, IBM. What about remote data local analysis? So if you've heard of REST APIs, this might be for you. You can do searches. You can make queries online. You can download small pieces of data, pieces of catalogs, do all the analysis and plotting on your laptop, say. This is option two. Option three, actually working on the remote web-based platform. This is great for quick exploration. This is great for full analysis of the particle data without downloading anything. And it's great for prototyping and developing your analysis scripts. And I was simply explaining here these three different ways to um, basically analyze, so download or not, and analyze the data, right? And then I was jumping immediately, and I was going to show you uh, the actual website and give you a bit of a, a walkthrough, hopefully, if it works, and um, show you how this works a bit more in practice. So I'm going to actually quit the slide and open up a, a web browser. So you should probably be seeing our beautiful Slack um, I imagine, and I'm just going to go to the TNG website here and type it in, and this is where you land. And so if you click on data access on the top bar here, you get to the data page for these simulations. What you see here on the upper left is uh, getting started. This explains exactly what I just explained. There's three ways to, to look at the data, to analyze the data. Uh, here in the lower left is documentation. This is quite important. I'll show you a bit of this. On the upper right, we have a few tools for exploration and quick looks at the data. And then lower right here, there's a discussion forum for questions, uh, an FAQ, and so on. Um, let's start with actually downloading the data. So if you go down on this page, what you see here is an actual table of the simulations which exist and which are available. So let me hide the dark matter only version. So these are the these are only the baryonic simulations that have gas in them. And you see the different families, right? So you see the T TNG 100 simulations, dash one, dash two, and dash three. These are the three different resolution levels. So going down in resolution, here's TNG 300, the large volume, here's TNG 50, small volume, here's the original illustrious simulation, and eagle sitting at the bottom. So for each simulation, you have just a little bit of metadata. You have the size of the volume itself. You have a number of dark matter particles, some resolution statistics in terms of the mass of the dark matter particle, the mass of gas, the number of snapshots, the number of subhalos, so that's a proxy for the number of galaxies, say, in the simulation of redshift zero. And if you go into one of these pages, so I'll just click on the TNG 101 and open it in a new tab, um, where you get to, and the top is just, a, again, a list of metadata about this simulation, how it was run, what the box size is, what the cosmology was, and so on. And if you scroll down, you get to a table 
of the actual snapshots. So starting with snapshot zero at redshift 20 and going down to the bottom, the last snapshot is snapshot 99 at redshift zero. Right, again, all these numbers are just some statistics about each snapshot, so where they are, how many particles and how many galaxies exist at that point in time. And these links, so if you click on download snapshot, you get uh, an offer here for a wget command, which if you type that into a console, will start to download, download as it says, unfortunately, uh, 500 gigabytes worth of data to get that snapshot. So you can go ahead and download that into your uh, cluster for analysis. And what you're actually doing there, as it says, is this snapshot is split into several files. And if you go and click on this link, you can see indeed that a snapshot is simply a collection of a bunch of very small files, and you can download them. Click on one and you'll get uh, a download even in the web browser of that particular piece of the snapshot, the 1.2 gigabytes in this context. Okay, so that's actually downloading uh, data directly. Back right here, let me go through in about two minutes the documentation, which is quite important, right? So link one background in important details, as it says, it's important details, right? It's just an overview of the simulation. So in the context of TNG, it presents the three boxes and what each of them are, what their characteristics are. Talks a bit about the resolution in these three simulations. And then this table, again, gives you a complete listing of all the illustrious TNG simulations. On the top are the baryonic runs, and on the bottom here are the dark matter only analogs for each of those volumes, and again, statistics about each. Uh, back here at the top, um, scientific remarks and cautions, right? This would be quite important for anyone who's interested in the data. This discusses observational uh, tensions with the simulations, and it discusses discusses numerical considerations, which are important to know when you start to dig into the data. Okay, so that's the background, important details. The next piece of documentation is the specifications. Again, this is quite important. This tells you every possible piece of information you could need to know about the data. So about the snapshots here at the top, then about the catalogs, about the merger trees, and so on. So for instance, if we want to understand what is in the snapshots with respect to the gas, we can go down to particle type zero, the gas, and here we have a listing of every field that we know about for every gas cell. So it's name, uh, the units, right? The units have to be taken into account very carefully when you're converting any of these fields into a physical quantity, and then a description of the field itself. Okay, so let me go back to the top. As with the particle data and the snapshots, we also have details about the catalog objects, the dark matter halos here and the subhalos or the galaxies. So if I go down to the subhalos, for instance, I can see a listing of the properties, every property we know already computed about subhalos, uh, their units and descriptions. For instance, uh, well, the center of mass, XYZ position, or scroll down to the total mass of the subhalo, just the number in units of 10 to the 10 solar masses over H, or maybe say the uh, star formation rate of the subhalo in solar masses per year, just to give three quick examples. Okay, so those are the two most important pieces of documentation, right? The background and the data specifications. Then we have two kind of walkthroughs showing you, if you download the data onto your local machine, how to actually uh, load it and do some very simple analysis. Uh, the second walkthrough here of the web-based API is showing you this option number two. So if you want to actually make, um, if you don't want to download any data, instead you want to make remote requests and um, do the analysis locally, this is a, a, the second way of working with the data. So I'm not going to jump into these right now, but I'll just open it very quickly to show you that what it is is essentially a step-by-step -step walkthrough in Python or, or IDL, as you like, um, going through the steps of how you would use this service um, from the very beginning. So quite easy to follow and walk through in, say, half an hour or so. Okay. Um, the form here is filled with questions and uh, people asking what is going on. So I encourage you to also post their questions or things are not working, and we try to answer them. And an FAQ, of course, always good to check. 
Um, let me focus here on the upper right. So these are a few very important things. The, the top is option three. Right? This is the web-based interface for analyzing the data remotely, and I'm going to jump into that in just a second. Uh, first, I want to show you these three other um, quick tools, which are all just ways to make very quick exploration of the data. So let me open the first one here. It's called Search the Catalogs, right? And what this page is, it simply allows you to select a simulation and select a snapshot or redshift, so it'll be a redshift zero, and then make a search over the catalogs. So right now I searched on the mass of a halo with these two bounds, and I've gotten this list of objects, which you can see below. If I scroll down, there's indeed a whole lot of, I'm sorry, 43,000 matching subhalos, which match that particular search. And if I wanted to make some other kind of search on a property we know, for instance, the star formation rate, I could you know, restrict this further between five and eight solar masses per year, hit search again, and get a, a listing of the objects which satisfied that criteria. There's actually only six which satisfy this combined restriction on mass and star formation rate. So a quick way to see what is in the catalog. Okay, let me go back to the main page. The second tool here, it says plot catalogs. It's very similar. It allows you to take a very quick look at relationships uh, between properties of halos or galaxies. So again, first pick the simulation, TNG 100, pick the redshift or the snapshot, and then a whole bunch of options. And if you just leave that all alone, hit request plot, you get a default. And what this default is, is the specific star formation rate versus stellar mass for every central galaxy in the simulation, redshift zero. This is the TNG 100 result, right? So we can change things. So we can plot all kinds of things about galaxies. And if you hover over one of these possibilities for what you want on the x-axis, you'll get a little description here, for instance, the galaxy gas fraction. So we can let's leave the x-axis on the stellar mass, which is uh, which I like, and say, let's look at the mass and elicity relation. So let's put a list of the gas on the y-axis, request the plot, and there is the mass and metallicity relation for this simulation. So gas phase metallicity is a function of stellar mass. The one other very nice um, tool here is that right now the color of this plot represents the number of galaxies, right? It's just showing you how many galaxies are on this plane of metallicity versus stellar mass. But we can actually um, use, instead of, we can assign a color to every pixel based on the values of the galaxies which are there. So we could, for instance, pick the gas fraction. So let's color the plot by the gas fraction of galaxies. And you see that the color bar here has changed now to be the gas fraction. And these are so higher gas fractions at lower masses, low gas fractions for quenched galaxies. Um, very quick exploration of what these catalog data show you. Okay, so that's enough of that. The last Quick little tool here for exploring is this thing called Visualize. It's very similar, right? Pick the simulation, pick the object, either in terms of the subhalo number or the halo number, and then lots of options. Again, leave them all alone, hit Visualize, and you get the default, which is a picture, perhaps, if my internet works, or not. Typically, a picture of halo 320 for a TNG 100 1. Uh, it's quite impressively not working, too bad. Let me try again, refresh. Very strange. Uh, do I actually have this block? No. Okay, so there it is. So this is a, a rendered image of this particular halo. So the circle is the virial radius. Here's the color bar at the bottom, gas column density. So made on the fly when I demanded it. That's why it's a bit slow. Right? So we can change what we're looking at. And there's a, a huge number of things. So we can look at, say, we're looking at gas column density. We could change it to the stars and look at the stellar column density, which is this image instead, or any other property of the particles we know about. And there's an extraordinary number here, including uh, many things, look at it later, for any object, any halo, or any galaxy, in any simulation, any redshift. So, very powerful way to visualize a sample of objects which you found interesting. Okay, so, in the last, I don't know, five minutes, hopefully, or so, I want to show you 
the last um, tool here, which is the Jupyter Lab interface. So I'll click on it. You get to a page that looks like this. Uh, if you scroll down, there'll be a bottom here, a button which says uh, request access, probably if you have never done this before, or if you've already pushed that button and we granted access, then it will say launch now. If I click on that, again, if, if things work, you should see a screen which looks something like this. Okay, so what have we just done? We've launched a small little compute um, system. So, uh, uh, yeah, a remote uh, compute uh, instance on a server in Germany where there is a copy of all of these simulations. So we can now uh, run code here and analyze and load the data, which looks as if it's sitting there locally on this computer. So if you've ever used JupyterLab before, you're familiar with this interface. If not, you can also start a normal Jupyter notebook in this context. So the reason I like this is because we can, we can start a terminal here. We can use a normal Linux terminal. And at the same time, we can open up, say, a Python script, and we can flip it over to the right-hand side, and we can start up you know, Python in the terminal. I can type. And we can you know, develop and edit our script while at the same time running things in Python. So personally, this is how I work. And this is why I really like this interface, because you can directly edit files in a text editor on the right, use a terminal in the middle, and um, Yes, it's all again running remotely on the server where the data is. So let me list the directory here. So what's actually in this directory? Um, there's a few, there's an examples folder. There's some scripts. These are the helper scripts to use to load the data. And then there's three folders called Sims Illustrious, Sims Other, and Sims TNG. So what Sim does, you know, inside Sims Illustrious is literally the three old illustrious simulations and their dark matter analogs. Similarly in TNG, the actual illustrious TNG simulation. So if we go into one of these folders, say we just go to TNG 100-1, there's an output directory, there's a post-processing directory, and there's something called simulation.h5. We go into the output directory, say, here we see 100 folders called groups. These are the group catalogs, 100 folders called snap. These are the snapshots, the initial conditions, subboxes, I won't get into that. And then say in the groups of snapshot zero, we have just a literal dump of all the HDF5 files of the simulation. So this is literally looking at the simulation data uh, as it exists, as we use it uh, all the time, every day. Okay, so let me show you very quickly an example of analysis. So I'm just going to go in here into the examples folder. And if you do that, you'll see a tutorial file, which looks like this. So this is a, a walkthrough a very short tutorial of loading and analyzing data in this platform. So I'm going to go super fast, of course, just to give you a flavor. So we're importing us uh, the usual modules. We define what simulation we're interested in looking at just by setting the path. So the TNG 100-1 simulation. And then, for instance, we can load the catalog. So this command is loading all the subhalos in the catalog, and it's loading the mass and the star formation rate of the subhalos. So if you type this command here, you're literally lo loading again the local data because this uh, compute instance is running on the cluster where the data is. Then I go through making a quick plot of star formation rate versus mass of the halo. That looks a bit funny. I get down to star formation rate versus galaxy stellar mass. That looks a bit better. And this is indeed, this is the star forming main sequence of the simulation. I keep going. I point out some cautions about these are star formation equals zero galaxies, so absolutely quenched galaxies, don't forget about them. And then we, we make a stellar mass function. So this is very simple, right? This is just maybe 20 lines of code, and we make the stellar mass function of this simulation, just a histogram of galaxy stellar mass. Um, I go a bit further here, so that was the catalogs, right? And then we look very quickly at the merger trees. So the merger trees, again, give you information as a function of time. So I just use this uh, load tree function to load for a few random objects. These five random objects, they are mass history. So the mass of that object as a function of time, and this is how they were assembled. For instance, we could use this to make the star formation histories of these objects. And then I go on to the actual particle data. So again, this very simple command, load subset, loads the actual gas, stars, or black holes from the simulation. And I make a picture just in these, say, 15 lines of code of the entire box, right? So you see 
I just made a two-dimensional histogram of all of the gas mass in the simulation. See the label here, gas mass surface density, and you see the cosmic web, the large-scale structure of this uh, TNG-100 simulation. The final thing down here, I'm again loading um, particles, but only of one specific object. So of a random halo, I load the temperature of the gas, and I just make a histogram. So this is maybe a reasonable temperature histogram of gas in one halo. And then I make a picture of it. Right? So this is, again, just a histogram of the temperature showing you roughly on a function of x and y how the temperature looks in such a halo. Okay, so that was extraordinarily fast, of course, and it's just to give a flavor of uh, all the analysis that you can do when you're running kind of in this online platform, which is, as I said before, a really good starting point for prototyping or doing some uh, initial looks, maybe then downloading data later. And um, the last comment I will make, I think, if I just go back to the main web page. So as you're exploring here, as you're using the lab, as you're maybe downloading actual data, these three methods, you can use them all together. Right? So you can use them as you like in the ways which are most comfortable to you to dig into the data, to analyze it remotely, to download pieces of it, to do plotting on the lab interface or do plotting on your local uh, system. And um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. It's of course, there's a lot of details, um, a lot of documentation to wrap your head around. But on the other hand, these getting started walkthrough tutorials are very simple. So I would encourage you to just jump in and give them a try if you have even 10 or 20 minutes to uh, start to play. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. That was amazing. What an amazing resource for the community. I mean, I, I have no idea how you support all of this. I know you shout out a couple of organizations on the bottom of the page, but like this just completely blew my mind as to the quality of the website, the interfaces, like, whew, wow. Wow, your collaboration has just done such amazing work making all of these data sets publicly available. So congratulations. Okay.